welcome and thanks for coming. I'm Marguerite Ann Smith from the Teaching and Learning Center. And I think most people know Mary Asperino, who also works here. And David Creelman is chairing today's meeting. This is the tail end of a VP Etc. meeting. We're glad you've joined us to hear Nick Cameron talk about lecture capture. Um, very last minute, uh, we decided, or I decided to uh, offer uh, this lecture available online. So, um, yeah, I should mention that you're all on the web right now. Um, so behave. And, uh, yeah. Visually. Um, well, right now it's yeah, you're protected. You're outside. Thank you. I'm I'm smack Larry. Larry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's like me. Yeah. Um, I should be able to and um, we're also recording, so uh, if um, you uh, thought you missed something or you know trying to scribble down notes, uh, you can watch this on YouTube as soon as we hit stop recording. So that's nice. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll breeze through some slides that have a whole whack of text on them. I hate slides that have a whole whack of text, um, but the reason I put them here is uh, just because this document will be available for download if you want to go back. And and read all that. Yeah. So uh, Can let's. Can I ask one little question? Yes. Did anybody connect to the people panel? Uh, let's see. We have one. One person. <laughs> no, uh, if they well, they have two options. Um, they can uh, join by Google Hangouts, and then it's just like a Skype call that we can uh, talk back and forth. Um, and there's also uh, uh, an option to look, uh, just watch on uh, YouTube. Uh, so they wouldn't participate uh, in the conversation. Um, so I'll, there's over 60 slides in this. I'm not going to go through all of them, and that's why it's available for download. I'm going to start from the very top, what is lecture capture, and then it's going to go down to really grainy, geeky levels. Um, so those are probably the parts I'm not going uh, not gonna to go over. So let's make sure everyone knows why they're here. What's lecture capture? Uh, it's just a term used to describe the process of capturing a lecture uh, archiving it and uh, making it available to students afterwards or to people. And uh, there are two approaches to doing this. You can do it live in the classroom, so you don't really change how you do uh, your, your lecture or anything. We just throw a camera at the back of the room, um, a microphone somewhere nearby, uh, the person that's speaking, and uh, record as is. You do your 60-minute lecture, and uh, we throw that recording either in, audio, in an audio package or, or video. Uh, throw it up online and people can see it that way. Uh, the other approach to doing lecture capture is, is back in your office in advance of class time. Um, so tip, where the other model is typically a 60-minute lecture, most people tend to do this if they're more interested in doing shorter 5-minute or 10-minute lessons. Um, so you record these, uh, these short 5-minute, 10-minute uh, clips back in your office, make them available online through something like T2L or YouTube, and uh, then encourage your students to watch them uh, at home in advance of uh, class time. So, why is it? Why would anyone do lecture capture? What, what's it? Uh, what's it good for? It's good for a few things. One is accessibility. Um, having those recordings uh, can uh, do a very good job at accommodating different learning disabilities. Um, also, uh, different. Uh, uh, physical impairments like, like hearing impairments or visual impairments. So it remo removes that anxiety, knowing that you have a visual impairment that you might miss something, knowing that you can go back and actually uh, review the lecture. So it really helps there. Um, having these recordings also opens up the opportunity for transcription. So you can actually make a transcription of, the, uh, of your lecture, and that opens up all kinds of, uh, of uh, benefits, uh, especially in access the, area of access uh, the area of accessibility. Another big reason people do lecture capture is uh, in, it enables them to do the, the flipped classroom approach of teaching. Um, really big trend in K-12 right now. It's been moving its way into higher ed the past couple of years. And uh, the flipped classroom, a lot of people in this room are already familiar with it, but if you don't know, it's uh, this tr uh, transitioning your role as, a, as an educator from being the, the marketing term for it is the sage on stage, the guide on the side. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Any K-12 teacher will probably know that saying um, in the comments is been drilled in their head. Um, so the, the idea is rather than doing a 60-minute lecture where you stand at the front of the classroom and just speak for 60 minutes, um, you instead offer that online 
tell your students to watch it before class so then you can do uh, exercises, group activities, that kind of thing in, um, in the classroom. So you're, you're going from you know, being a traditional lecturer to more of a, a facilitator of learning and uh, guiding them through those exercises. Another big reason for lecture capture, MOOCs. MOOCs are really popular right now. Um, so this is just uh, making your uh, course freely and openly available online. MIT is a real leader in this. They have their own environment called MIT OpenCourseWare. Uh, where they make all their courses available and most of their courses available. And uh, then there are some other services open to anyone with Udacity and Coursera. Um, but you don't necessarily have to offer it, offer it as a course. You can just throw up everything online and, and, and see what happens, uh, see what kind of interest you can generate uh, by putting it in public places like YouTube, iTunes U. Uh, again, MIT is quite a leader in this. They have their own environment, MIT Video. Um, really cool to check those two places out, uh, their video website and uh, OpenCourseWare. Um, some other benefits of uh, lecture capture. Uh, for students, it's going to give them the opportunity to review the lecture, enhance their notes. They might have missed something. Um, they might have missed class, so now they can make up for it. Um, and I put the MBA here because as an MBA student, we, we do a lot of um, group presentations, individual presentations, and I know I would really appreciate it if I could go back and look at my presentations and see how I, I can improve. Because um, sometimes it's hard taking that criticism. You have a prop tell you you really need to you know, improve in this area. And yeah, if you can actually see it, maybe I'll believe it. <laughs> um, and I also put thesis proposals and defenses here because that is the number one request I get for reporting on this campus is uh, proposals and uh, defenses for uh, graduate students. From the students? Yeah, from the student. Uh, sometimes from the faculty too. They uh, they encourage them that, um, that, that there would be interest outside campus. And, yeah. uh, for faculty, one of the most common things uh, we hear from faculty that do do this is that they, they, it, they've uh, said that it opened up some extra time in their class um, and enabled them to teach more. And when I say teach more, I don't necessarily mean rather than just doing chapters 1 through 6, you're going to do 1 through 9. Um, it could mean you still do 1 through 6, but now you can supplement chapter 5 with some extra articles they found online, that kind of thing. So uh, what are we doing today uh, for lecture capture here on this campus? Well, as with most campuses, it's uh, most of it's unauthorized. Uh, due to the popularity of cell phones and uh, mobile te technology, everyone has a recording device in their pocket. So uh, they're not asking permission, and they're just going ahead and recording themselves. There's uh, what I call Dr. DIY. These are the uh, driven faculty that just figured it out themselves. They have their own methods and they're using all kinds of different tools, uh, most often uh, very cheap or uh, free uh, pieces of software that will let them do this. Um, PowerPoint has a, a feature that they call annotations that um, will let you write on top of your slides and record an audio annotation uh, annotation for each of the slides and export that as a video. Uh, Cam Studio is an open source product. Uh, Smart Notebook uh, has a recording feature uh, that's made by uh, smart boards. And uh, mobile apps, really interesting stuff going on in that area. Um, not quite uh, in prime time yet, but some, some interesting things coming out. Student services on this campus is in the business of doing lecture capture today. They have been the past couple of years. Um, and their focus is uh, students with accessibility needs, um, both learning disabilities and physical impairments. Um, and they're mostly using iPads and uh, some handheld recorders uh, for doing this. Uh, Rob Hafford is the system technology specialist on campus, um, so he uh, is sort of the main go-to person for that and uh, offers assistance to, to students with this, but it's mostly administered by the students. They give them this handheld recorder or an iPad, and the student does, them, uh, does the recordings themselves, manages them, records them. Excuse me. Yes. The department asked the student to clear it with the prof first. Um, they the they they notify them, but uh, they they have a pretty strong they put on a pretty uh, a pretty tough face when they when they tell them because they uh, it's their job to um, I guess pr protect the the rights of the student. They really see it as a right um, that they. Uh, with those certain um, disabilities or impairments, they do have a right to to record the class. Oh, so I don't. 
question that they have the right. It's just that I would like to know if someone's recording. Oh yeah, definitely. There, there is yeah some communication that goes on between. Okay. Just yeah. like when we give them time and a half for an exam. Yeah. Right? Yeah, it's handled know. the exact same way. Actually. Okay. Yeah, it's the same process. Okay. Yeah. But there are some students that record the lecture that you don't know the recording. Yeah, and they that's. They don't have accessibility oh, issues necessarily. No, they just they want have, they just option to back out. Yeah. And that's something that's worth worth mentioning, I guess, kind of off the bat. I'll meant go into it later, but um, you know, there are a lot of opponents to lecture capture because of intellectual property concerns and privacy concerns. Mm -hmm. This is a way that we can kind of control it rather than right. than doing it without without us knowing. So just sort of keep that in mind as we go through it. Um, another uh, sort of the last area that we're uh, the last method that we're doing lecture capture today on on the St. John campus is uh, using Blackboard Collaborate. Um, we just started doing that this past uh, winter term. Um, we had uh, one participant, was uh, Dr. Sandy Bell, with uh, one of our English courses, an upper level English course. It's a three hour long, one day a week course. Um, and uh, Mary Astorino and myself helped her uh, get it set up. But from there on, uh, pretty independent, never asked us for help. Um, and uh, it was just this, yeah, just this past semester. Uh, so if you don't know what Blackboard Collaborate is, uh, it's a uh, this thing here, this is what it looks like. This is uh, your webcam capture area here up in the left hand corner. Um, this big open white area is your content capture area. So this can be used as a uh, virtual whiteboard or uh, you can do a screen capture. Um, so when I say screen, I'll say screen capture a couple times. That I mean, it, whatever you see on your computer that you're using, it will, uh, it will show up there in the report. So why do we go ahead? And just pick something without ever consulting you guys or anything, um, because we had to do it quick. We were asked to do it right away, and it was free. It was already available. Some well, it's free to us. Someone already paid for it. Um, it smells not free. Yeah. <laughs> it would be free to pay for yeah. Uh, yeah. CETL and, and Fredericton. Uh, it's a tool that they use for mostly another purpose, um, but it had this recording feature, so uh, we could use it right away. They already had it set up. We didn't have to do anything. We just had to throw a microphone in the room, and it was ready to go. Um, but as a lecture capture tool, we ran into uh, some issues, and that's really due to the fact that this isn't a lecture capture tool. It's uh, it's a tool used for uh, distance learning, um, and uh, it just happens to have this recording feature. None of the issues that we encountered were, were um, you know, too uh, too serious. But just if we were to scale this up and offer it to more people, those issues would just be more uh, more uh, uh, serious and more numbers probably. Uh, so we asked students what was it like uh, having this available to them. Uh, did they find it useful? They let us know the kind of uh, technical issues they had. Again, nothing too serious. They can all be overcome. Um, but we asked, is it, was it actually useful to them? Um, I think everyone but one said, said yes. Just one person. <laughs> There's always one. So, uh, said it was useful, and uh, we asked why. Uh, they said most, pretty much everyone said uh, they, it, they were able to catch things uh, it, uh, that they missed originally in their notes, and uh, and most of those people further uh, sort of qualified in that in saying that because this was a three-hour-long course, it's more likely that you're going to miss something in a three-hour-long course. So that's good to know that we uh, originally thought three-hour longer courses would be more challenging uh, to record, so we were going to put them out of our criteria of this pilot. But it's uh, it's good to hear things like that because now we know that's a priority. Um, and uh, one thing that we heard from more than one person that I thought was interesting is that they could use the lecture as a reference on their papers. Mm -hmm. I, there's probably some different opinions on that, but it's interesting. Yeah, it's this class at this moment in time. Yeah. I don't know how that works in APA. But, um, Rob Pafford asked uh, some of the folks using iPads and handheld recorders uh, just what it was like for them using, uh, using those devices. Um, we were really skeptical about the iPad. I didn't think it was going to do a great job, but the audio quality was actually very good. Um, the one thing you have to keep in mind is just handling noise. If you're going to use the iPad for other purposes like note taking, um, just know where the microphone is. Make sure it's uh, you know not blocked, that it's pointing at the speaker, and that you're not uh, you know handling it too loudly or anything. That you're uh, being careful with how you handle the iPad. Um, the Zoom H1, that's just a model of handheld recorder. It's a very small one. Uh, so we thought that was great because it's portable and uh, you can put it anywhere in the classroom uh, without uh, disturbing anyone or anything like that. It can fit on your desk. 
but it actually ended up being an issue because uh, one person in particular actually also had a visual impairment, and they said they couldn't adjust the settings or anything like that um, because they were too small and they couldn't read them, and it ended up being an issue because there were some times that they would have to uh, sort of turn up the volume to get to, to capture some lower speakers, and uh, that wasn't possible. So good thing to keep in mind. Uh, I had some brief brief conversations with Dr. Uh, DIY. You should all meet him. Her. Um, and uh, some uh, reoccurring uh, things that I've I've heard from people that do their own solutions. Just that it's very time consuming. Um, it ties up their computer. So often uh, video files are big. And when you hit stop record uh, or you're doing some editing, uh, your computer might be tied up processing that video for a good few minutes. So um, that was a big complaint. Um, I put unstable there because uh, a lot of these uh, concoctions were uh, sort of home brewed or they were using open source software like uh, Cam Studio. Um, open source things like Cam Studio often have dependencies on other pieces of software. If you upgrade one version, you have to upgrade the other one, and there just all these conflicts happen, so it can be unstable. Um, and uh, I've also had some conversations with faculty on campus about just some of the potential that's out there for apps, and it's really a blind spot of mine. I'm not much of an app junkie, so uh, something that uh, should be shifting our focus on, just what's going on in the, the mobile technology world. And uh, last, uh, I guess it was December. In December, before we started this pilot with uh, Blackboard, we wanted to get some participants. Um, so we went around to faculty council and, and uh, tried to, our goal was to, to get some uh, people doing this. Um, weren't too successful there. We just, uh, we knew uh, Dr. Bell was going to gonna do it already, but we, did, we were hoping to get more people, but we didn't. But uh, we had some really good conversations just about lecture capture in general. What are some of the concerns and that kind of thing. And then number one, intellectual property and privacy. That's a huge concern that uh, needs to be addressed. Also, some concerns about student attendance um, is going to go down. Um, there's different opinions on that. Some, I've been told uh, there has been research in this that suggests uh, student attendance is either not affected or very little, but I, I haven't seen that. Um, but you know, something we can look into for a university. Right. We're good at research. Student attendance not lecture. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you if you change maybe to that flipped classroom yeah. style, it might actually help. Um, the other uh, big thing that we heard about was time. Uh, just uh, the amount of time it's going to take to train yourself to use uh, use this technology, to manage the videos, to edit them. Uh, and one person summed it up very well uh, by saying that uh, you're trying to cram so much into that 50 minutes that losing just a couple of minutes to setting up this recording or something is uh, definitely detrimental detrimental to the students' education, so we don't want to risk that. So the problem with what we're doing today, it's all these different kind of scattered solutions. It's uncoordinated. Um, there's no real official support structure. You can come to me. You can come to Mary. You can come to Rob Paffer. Um, which of one of us of the three you should go to? I don't know. Um, <laughs> whoever you can get a hold of. I guess um, you know there, there's not really much planning as far as how uh, how we're going to support this, but we're, we're you know in the interim we definitely are here to help. Um, and if you come to us saying I, I want to do lecture capture, we don't have that one sort of go-to solution that's uh, that we can offer you, one that's scalable that we can offer to many faculty. Um, we sort of have to scramble to see what your budget is, what's uh, how much are you willing to do yourself, how much of it has to be automated, that kind of thing. Um, and there's no, uh, as of now, there, there is no current uh, university policy on recording classes. There's one in development um, with some folks on both campuses in Fredericton and St. John that are working together to create one, but nothing in place right now. Um, so what I'd like to see going forward is a, a lecture capture user group or committee, if you want to call it that. And uh, what's important for uh, this group is that uh, they have a, a nice wide representation of the campus community. So uh, in faculty, we need uh, all three faculties represented. We need all learning uh, or uh, sort of teaching styles represented. So we don't want to come up with a solution that's just uh, a very well-suited solution for uh, that sage on the stage. It needs to be one that's, uh, that can maybe help in uh, areas of uh, team-based learning classes, that kind of thing. Um, 
and uh, we need proponents of uh, lecture capture, people that understand the, the value of it, the benefits it can offer. Um, but we also need people that are opponents of, uh, of lecture capture. Uh, people will make sure that we're, we're not wasting our time and money, that, uh, that they're really going to challenge us and make sure we're, we're doing something that's worth it. Uh, need students on this uh, committee to make sure we're actually meeting the needs, otherwise why should we do this? Um, and we need expertise in some, in some key areas like education, people that know something about uh, the different uh, teaching styles. Um, someone that knows something about accessibility, technology, and intellectual property and privacy. Um, I think this group should lead by example, so meeting in person, but also uh, meeting online, um, using some of those tools uh, that they're uh, talking about to really demonstrate the power of those tools. And um, post as much as possible online, um, and that will just help them be more transparent. So draft documents, uh, meeting minutes, um, a cool video you saw on YouTube that talks about lecture capture that you think people might be interested in. Sharing all these things online to, uh, to be transparent and also to sort of help facilitate a community about, uh, about lecture capture on campus. And um, I think the more transparent we can be, the more we're going to address those uh, accessibility or, um, uh, privacy and intellectual property concerns. And really, there's just two tasks for this group. Come up with a solution. Um, and uh, develop a policy that, that protects um, those that are being recorded or being affected by the recording. Um, I can dive into sort of the nitty gritty of what a solution for lecture capture looks like, um, what, it, yeah, what it would mean in, uh, in a classroom or, or in your office, but I guess if I do that, is there sort of a good understanding of what le lecture capture is and what it has to offer? Any questions about that? Are we ready for both the video and the audio, or would the audio be easier to start up with? Audio is definitely easier. Um, video, uh, big files, uh, especially if you want to be able to uh, edit and manipulate uh, the recordings, uh, it's always easier in volumes because they're, they're smaller. Um, don't require as much resources to edit. Um, because in, in a video, you're doing both. You're not just editing the audio, but you're editing the video as well. So. Um, but uh, we're really starting at square one. Like I said, some of the solutions that are presented earlier, uh, they're, they're just kind of things we've done on the fly. Uh, nothing really we've been much thought to or, or uh, you know, strategy, you know, sort of strategic thinking about or anything. It's just kind of done on the spot. So you can really. Yeah, we're really at square one. Yeah. Um, in, in thinking of a whole solution, you sort of have to think of these three key areas, but I'm going to ignore those two because those are the ones that get really geeky. Um, and we'll just, uh, you know, for just the next few minutes, we'll, we'll just talk about this one, the capture method. Um, so you can capture your lecture really in uh, with, uh, two technical solutions. Using a hardware solution, one that uh, has dedicated hardware for the sole task of recording a lecture like a VCR, like a VCR or a DDR. Um, or you can go the software route, um, download some software for your computer that, uh, that can do that. Um, so in a software solution, it's very simple. There's, there's very few components. You just need a device that has a microphone and a camera. In the case of laptops and tablets and phones, they all come with them built in, so that's great. Desktop, you can buy one. A good quality webcam for about 100 bucks, 130 bucks. Um, and you need some software. So why would you go the software route over hardware? It's much more affordable. Most of us already have a laptop or, or a, a tablet computer or cell phone that has a webcam and a microphone. Um, and that makes it accessible from anywhere. It's not like uh, putting a, installing all this hardware into a classroom and it just lives in that classroom. You can carry that tablet computer or that laptop with you wherever you go, uh, including your own office. Um, so that makes, a, makes this, uh, the software approach a much more uh, scalable uh, way of doing lecture capture. A hardware solution has a lot more uh, components to it. Um, rather than a built-in camera, you're going to have this uh, big external thing that you mount on the wall, a couple of different microphones. Um, a confidence monitor, so that, that's a big screen mounted on the wall that so you can actually see what's being recorded. Um, 
because often what will happen is uh, maybe the camera is set at the podium at the beginning of the class because that's where you're speaking from, but then you go to the whiteboard to write it down. Um, you need to be reminded that you have to move the camera, so having a big screen will show you the camera still on the podium reminds you to go move the camera. Uh, a control interface, uh, just a, a system that will let you actually move the camera um, side to side, zooming, that kind of thing. Encoder is the device that actually does the recording, takes the video and audio signal and makes it into a file. Uh, storage delivery, we need somewhere on the web uh, where we can store these files securely, preferably backed up, redundant backup, and uh, make it a way to make it uh, publicly available to students. So will we use our own uh, D2L to store, or where will we store it? D2L um, has a lecture capture solution that we could purchase, but it, it's something we're paying for in a year. It's something that, it's a service that we're currently not um, paying into. Um, but you can still use D2L as sort of a, a distribution method or as a link to your students. Um, so we need another area to store it. Um, uh, UMB does have a, a subscription to a service called Brightcove, um, which is a video streaming service um, that we entered a five-year contract into, I think we're two and a half years through, and we're approaching the capacity limit, I think. Oh, no, it's always, it's always over capacity. Oh. And we, we get charged for, for the mortgages, so we work actually can down the supervisor and the library, what can we do? Because actually we are giving you less than you will get in the uh, that they give you for free for um, and then so we are looking forward to to ask to ask us where do we put this, the, we, we tell people just open a, a YouTube channel on your own or a, or a, that's an animation, a, or a video or an account a, and host it yourself and then you put the link or you can embed the, embed the, the window in D2L which is, looks much better and it works really well uh, instead of trying to put it on Right. So, uh, so yeah, it's a, kind of, it's a short term solution, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah whenever I uh, say storage and delivery, there's really three options there's um, hosting it ourselves. Uh, the cloud, and when I say the cloud, I mean a paid cloud service. Mm -hmm. And then there are free cloud services like YouTube. And really, YouTube is sort of king in that, in that arena, so I just mentioned YouTube. Um, yeah, Brightcove is a paid cloud service, and we pay for um, the amount of storage, so the amount of video that we actually want to throw up there, and um, the amount that's viewed. So if something goes viral, that, and uh, everyone wants to see how brilliant this faculty is at UMBSJ, great, but we're going to pay more for it. Um, <laughs> So it better be really for fun. Um, and uh, the self-hosted solution, um, a lot of people think of that. They'll see the cost of a paid cloud solution. It's uh, a bit, uh, you're either going to pay monthly or annually. And they say, no, no, I just want to. I want to put down five grand and be done with it. Well, technology gets old. So even if we were to host it ourselves, we're going to have to replace those servers every uh, couple of years. And um, we're going to outgrow our, our capacity. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. 
Um, so why would you go up with a hardware solution over over software? Um, because it's dedicated hardware, it's it's typically more reliable. We've all had you know uh, our computers crash on us when we're in the middle of writing some, some excruciating long document. Lose all your work. Um, these things are less likely to crash. You're probably going to get a higher quality out of, out of, uh, out of a hardware solution. Um, but one of the big things is uh, you can re reduce setup time and wrap time. So what I mean by that is if, uh, say we went with a software solution, install the software on the computer in the classroom, you go into the classroom, and the professor before you shut the computer down. So now you got to start it up. That's five minutes. Then you got to log in. That's four minutes. Then you got to start the program. That's another couple of minutes. So all, all of a sudden you've lost 10 minutes or 15 minutes to get in the darn thing started. Um, this stuff is sitting there ready to go. All you got to do is come in and hit record. In fact, we can even automate it. We can uh, hook it up to our the same system that controls uh, our projectors that turn them on and off, um, and uh, have it automated so every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 8.30, uh, recording starts. Um, and another big advantage to uh, a hardware solution is we're going to be able to record from any source. Uh, so with software, you're stuck with the uh, uh, I was, I was tied up in a um, saying. Uh, you're, you're stuck with a computer that uh, software is installed on. Um, so uh, if uh, you're using uh, your iPad and have some sort of software that records the screen of your iPad, the presentation that you have on here, um, and then there were student presentations today, and that student brought in a laptop, you're going to have to install that software on your laptop. Um, or figure it's, there's some other uh, ways of doing it, but very technical, very, uh, not very intuitive, not very quickly. Uh, you're not going to be able to do it very quickly. In a hardware solution, uh, we can hook it up so that it just takes the video signal. Whatever video signal is going to the projector, it goes to that encoder recording device. Um, so it's going to be able, it doesn't matter whether they're using the laptop, computer in the room, um, we can capture it. Including the whiteboard itself. Um, Webcam to capture the whiteboard, a little too low resolution. It's hard to get the lighting properly, that kind of thing. But in a classroom that we know uh, we're going to outfit for this kind of thing, we can get the lighting set up properly, and we can get a nice quality high resolution camera that will capture the whiteboard in all the detail, that little tiny handwriting. Um, what I'm suggesting this, this user group looks at is a hybrid solution, doing both. Um, so we, we look at a, a good candidate, a good classroom that uh, would make a good candidate for a hardware solution, um, come up with a funding proposal for that. Um, and then in the meantime, we trial some software. We try some free trials, uh, cheap uh, iPad apps that are available, and see what works best and, and uh, make some recommendations from there. Uh, Irving Hall 107 is a room that's kind of well suited for this. We could talk about that. Um, there's some other rooms that are uh, make good candidates. Um, as far as software goes, lots of different apps out there. I don't know too many. There's one called Screen Chomp that I played a bit with, but I'm, it's really not my area of expertise. So I, I wish I knew more about it, but um, if you're an app junkie, you really want you on this. Uh, um, in the uh, desktop, laptop world, uh, Camtasia Studio is, is king. Uh, there's other products out there, but really Camtasia Studio uh, is, a, is a great product that costs 300 bucks a pop, so it's uh, not the cheapest one. Uh, but one thing I will mention is that Hans W. Clone 208, it's our uh, digital media production suite on campus. Um, it's a private room that you can book for however long you need it. And uh, it has that software installed on there, along with all other kinds of uh, pieces of software that might, you might find useful. Um, microphones, multiple microphones if you want to bring in guests and, and have uh, some uh, guest lecturers in. This is sort of an imaginary timeline at this point. Um, if we could get a group like this together, we can uh, start talking about lecture capture now and uh, come up with some recommendations by winter, come up with a proposal for non-space funding, and uh, hopefully this time next year be installing a system in a classroom and trying out some different pieces of software and be ready to, to do this full force in uh, fall of 2015. Um, another... Uh, so my hidden uh, motive for doing this is that uh, uh, the same technology that does uh, lecture capture, we can do other things with it. Um, so that's a that's a nice thing about it. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, assistive hearing, uh, that is, uh, you know, having an earpiece uh, that uh, is hooked up to a radio receiver. Um, we tie that in with the microphone so that uh, people with hearing impairment can uh, can hear the instructor more clearly. That's a lot easier to deploy if we already have a, a nice, uh, robust uh, microphone solution in classrooms, and we did that because we're doing lecture capture. So that's that's one uh, thing that could spin off from this. I don't really know what the term is for this. I just for now I just called it stream to laptop. I don't. There's probably a better way of describing it. There's probably an actual term for it, but I don't know where it is. What I mean by this is. Uh, Right now, students are looking at the projector in front of them uh, to see the presentation materials. Uh, but with um, lecture capture technology, there's no. It would be very easy to uh, take that video signal and stream it out to students' laptops, so they can actually get a closer look on the laptop in front of the face. Um, so if they have a visual impairment, so that would really help them there. And it's uh, and it forces them to follow along too. It's not like uh, downloading the. PowerPoint in advance and kind of clicking along themselves. Their, their uh, slides would sort of switch through as you go through the PowerPoint. So, uh, Because we're putting microphones and cameras in the classroom, it also opens up some opportunities for, for conferencing. So you could uh, use Google Hangout like we are today, or Skype, or WebEx, GoToMeeting, all these different uh, solutions for uh, conferencing in class. So uh, bringing in guest lecturers, um, collaborating with other courses from other institutions, that kind of thing. So, yeah, join the team. Uh, drop me a line if you're interested. Uh, this document can be downloaded here at this link, and the video uh, of this presentation will be streaming there. One thing I forgot is I meant to do a screen share uh, of the video presentation. I, I, very, uh, I hit screen share very late in the game, so if you want to go watch the video later on, uh, download the document so you can follow along. So that's that's it. If you have any questions, would be well answered. Yeah. Yeah. Just going back to the uh, stream coordinates, I guess, where you might put the stream to classroom. Um, that's a possible bad new thing on our current wireless network because it's pretty now built for um, basic connection, not. Uh, massive push. Yeah. So there would be a mm -hmm. cost involved in start to look at that sort of stuff, especially from spread, uh, to go to that. Because then we have to look for more coverage, set for coverage as opposed to a real heavy duty uh, in one classroom. Like, okay, might like 40 devices connected in here, mm -hmm. but they're just pinging. Yeah. They're not all gathering what you're sending. Yeah. Um, no, definitely, and that, that's an issue for other um, other technical solutions that are be done, being done in the classroom today. Like, I, I had a course uh, uh, in October that we were doing uh, we were doing quizzes uh, through D2L every single course, and there are quizzes that counted uh, that towards your mark. They weren't just for fun or anything like that, or, or a learning exercise. It was, uh, yeah, the, the mark you got was the mark that contributed to your final grade. So, very important. Um, but there wasn't any planning that went into that, um, so there were some issues with uh, uh, getting people, getting 60 laptops at the same time in that one classroom to connect to that one access point. So it's an issue with um, with other solutions, and um, this is actually an area, this um, is yet another reason why we should invest more into wireless infrastructure, um, sort of helps make that argument, and especially because there's some accessibility uh, needs for this. and. Uh, uh, accessibility or demand because of accessibility needs. So that sort of helps in uh, getting some funding. So that that's. Uh, but yeah, definitely not a thing that we want to jump into without planning properly. Yeah. Yeah. So let's draw a network diagram for all the people. Yeah. Because <laughs> there are some, yeah, like there changes are coming though in, in the network design. Like right now, 
all traffic has to come back here to Hazen Hall. So if you're uh, if if uh, you have a laptop and yeah, you want to connect to that stream uh, in the same classroom, uh, you're at, you're over in the Poland Hall. Your internet or your network connection is actually coming back to Hazen Hall and going back to the classroom. Um, that's going to change uh, soon uh, with global switching. But yeah, probably a few months away or a year away. I think could be one one solution that I similar to collaborate that uh, that's both the video conferencing and also can become a classroom class capture system. It's um, the same people that make top cut, the company that makes top cut, they they also do like or they can extend talk as a bigger solution that is called um, Echoes 360. And Echo 360 is very interesting because it works a little bit like collaborate. So it, it brings everything inside. So you can, with talk hat, you during the class, you can share your screen so your students can see that. And at the same time, you can be capturing the camera and the screen to build it as a, as a class, a complete class or capture. Uh, but I think the issues uh, are the same in this case because then you have, you know, let's say you put it uh, that people are told, um, you end up with 60 or 100 mm. students plus the prop. Trying to use the network, and um, so so that, like you said, should be part of the conversation. The solution have to include kind of some kind of higher bandwidth or different systems to kind of, kind of manage this traffic because it is also computable. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I, mean, uh, I don't know how uh, they're all expensive. Yeah, the prices that we've looked at, it's very difficult. You're probably not going to find anything lower than 10,000 a year. Yeah. And, um, you know, a very high adoption rate, you'd be paying almost as much as 20,000 a year or so. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the range is 10 to 20,000 bucks a year for some of these tools. Um, what's nice about Echo 360 is that it, yeah, it integrates very well with lecture tools if you're going to use that as well. Yeah. So, yeah. it's one benefit. Yeah, we need to pay for presentation for that. That's one of the solutions we can offer. Sure. Well, especially because to get adoption, we need to help the head. Now, like uh, Ken has said, so we have the lab, we have to help you, help you, help, you, help them. Yeah. And to help them, the student, uh, you have to help the professor to learn something that is friendly and that it, it's not going to become, like you said, a, 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 kind of a, a big burden on yeah. the first half an hour of the, of the class every time because something is not working. So, is if they can learn one tool instead of two or three, um, and and then get this thing done. Uh, yeah. So, for the, some of you instructors here, have you been thinking about doing some lecture capture, or are you just interested in what's going on, or 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 just your thoughts on what you'd like to? Because it's hard for us. We know that we get snippets of it, but we we need to know. If, people are really interested in. Um, I use team-based learning, and the concept is, of course, that the students prepare for class, and then I give them a quiz as they come in to assess their readiness to learn. Well, how many students even buy the textbook, let alone read it before class? Yeah. So, um, no disrespect intended, but that's the reality. And therefore, I'm interested, and I talked about it with Nick and with Dr. Cleese and her faculty, about recording, not so much the video, because they don't need to see my lucky face, but I would hope that I could put up something and go over a problem on a whiteboard and maybe record that, uh, and that's where the PowerPoints that you can write over, yeah. yeah. then if it's PowerPoints that you can write over and then speak to, then that's a little less complicated, but whether, so I don't know which version I want, 
I, I don't want to capture my lecture because I don't lecture. So the only reason I capture my classroom experience is to promote team-based learning to other faculty because the learning is going on there and it is something to watch. It is lovely. But um, it's not something the students are going to watch again. Like, you know, they, they, they will have lived it. And I will be connected. You, you sort of want to capture some things like every time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we can. Yeah, and we can offer some. Sorry, I'm going to do what you were saying, Carol. I have to go back to my daughter grade five class where a teacher um, had a, is doing something very similar to this, uh, but they didn't actually do any lecture capture per se. What what he did is he came to class, and I have a very close relationship with, with, with this teacher and the whole classroom was overwhelmed. What they what they did was he went over the facts in. In your traditional, you know, save on the stage kind of way, kind of form. Then the students were given access to a website, and it was a for math. It was called IXL algorithm of one grade. And what this this particular program went right from kindergarten right through grade twelve. Okay. And what the students did is they went home, and the the exercises that they were using to practice were in play form. Okay. So it is. It's a game. You're going online, yeah, you're going in and you're practicing and you're learning math, uh, but it's fun. They couldn't wait to get home and use the product, right? You know, and we're talking about grade five students here, so they get home and they get on their computer system and they want to do it. Their class set a record for the number of uses of this particular product in one year. And so, unbelievable the, the marks that these kids had. I'm not going to say this directly in uh, relation to that particular product. Definitely had a lot to do with that teaching. But the way that the the way that this thing works was you have a product that the student can go to that's already pre-made, okay? Not lecture capture necessarily, but the product is already there, all right? The exercise is there, okay? And the teaching happens in a traditional form in the classroom, and they're linked back to the teacher. So when each student goes in uh, in this particular product, they know where they were having troubles, where they got five wrong, and and bring it back to you. So the teacher knows exactly how the students are doing this, where do we have to focus in on the class. So it's a lot of the preparation. And that's excellent. And then a lot of our textbook publishers have those. So they can do quizzes online or problem solving and see answers or flashcards. You know, uh, so those tools are there. And it's just encouraging students to do that as well. I just wanted to mention that uh, one, of the, one of the tools that you can use to do this is, is, uh, is Camtasia or Screen for the online techniques uh, that are quite expensive if you are not the department. And so some of my professors will be able to they need to use their DAs or something. So, uh, I found an alternative to the two of them that also is easier to learn. The learning curve is, is not uh, steep because it's less complex, but it lets you do the basics of all the other ones, which is you can record the uh, record your screen while you're speaking and recording your voice, mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time record your uh, your uh, webcam. And so you can look at the students, and then at the end, the same tool lets you cut from one to the other. So what is it? Called. It's called Screencast-O-Matic. Screencast-O-Matic. And, uh, and it's $15. <laughs> so, uh, what PDL cover There you go. There you go. So because that's that's the other issue. Yes, you can see that. And it's also ease of use. Yeah, and a lot of uh, things that people, when people are starting to get interested in, in lecture capture, the thing that they always ask about right away is uh, capturing the writing. Um, so uh, doing that with the camera doesn't look all that great, like I said earlier. Getting lighting just right with the camera and stuff can be uh, cumbersome sometimes. So we, we often offer digital solutions. Um, lots of choices out there. 
Um, iPad is one. If you don't have an iPad, then it might not be an affordable one. Uh, smart boards, you know, uh, again, very big. Probably not something you want to put in your office, but it's here. It's uh, it's available for use here. Uh, there's one over in the library that's also available for use. Um, and Wacom tablets. Uh, uh, Wacom tablets. These cost about 120 bucks. We're, there's quite a range of them. You can get them for 60 bucks. They're much smaller than this, um, but you pay more for the the larger ones. I think this one was 120. Um, and yeah, do very similar things. Now it's not like an iPad where you're. Some people find it awkward because you have to write down here and look at the screen. Um, but, but it's something you get used to. It's actually not that hard to use and uh, much cheaper than something like this. Yeah. And you can take it home with you. Yeah. yeah. There's LCD versions of this too, like smaller, more compact uh, ones that look just like an LCD monitor. But they're still two or three thousand bucks. So, um, yeah, hundred bucks. And the that. thing you have to think about no matter what you create, you have to figure out what do I do with it. So you get this little video file created um, with your lecture. So then you've got to figure out, okay, what type of file format is it? So talk to us before you do something, and then we can help you with that. Like with Screenomatic, what do you say that? Um, what types of files can you create? You can generate, uh, well, it depends on the, if it's on the mic, you can generate a quick time. Okay. If it's on the PCs, uh, I think they have also a version for the iPad, so you can do it directly in the iPad. You need to be able to then take that file and share it with everybody. That's why I didn't put it. Yeah. But once it's a quick demo or a send API, you can put it, put it on, on um, these right services. Code. That's right. right. And they, they do, the service does them. They transport it. So yeah, as long as the, 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 the codec is a, a generic one, like quick time, Okay. MP4 or yeah. yeah, these these services will take it. So if if any instructor is interested in say trying this once, mm -hmm. are we able to get in touch with you and yeah. you would walk us technophobes through the process? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a real barrier for some people is, to, yeah. to look at how much work this sounds like. I'm not familiar with the technology yet. Mm -hmm. Terminology. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's right. What's yeah. But maybe summertime, you know, if, yeah. if, if you're available for one on one sessions, then test a sample, a 10 or 15 minute video, and see how it goes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Who's the person that you would like to A lot of faculty and people like to start with. Uh, Recording on your own, a controlled environment, a controlled yeah. environment. <laughs> yes. Yes. and playing with it that way, uploading it someplace for your students to do well, for your students to view. And then because when you have a, a class, for example, mine over the winter, there were so many students that missed so many classes due to weather, and because yeah. it's not till one thirty, I was here anyway. The week. And so, and some students would miss the class, and I just thought about all of the time that I had to. Reschedule. They would come one on one, and I would essentially have to re-give the yeah. lecture one on one. Yeah. So yeah. this looks yeah. very, yeah. very good to me. And once you yeah. invest that time to make that ten-minute clip, you can use it year after year yes. after year. Yeah. Yeah. And the nice thing about personal control is that it does help at least for the moment bypass what other uses those lectures can be. Yes. I remember a couple of years ago being down in University of Tennessee and saying, "All right." Our sister uh, campus, and they have a whole office which is paying, you know, someone to come in and they put their course in a prop and they give them a stipend. They come in and they put their course on video. The university now owns that, and then they use that to sell the, the course mm -hmm. out to students individually. And the profs are no longer you know, the, the stipends, they, they get their, the profs get their one stipend, but they lose control of their material and after they're not getting paid any residual royalties for the use of that mm -hmm. course. Now that's this is an American policy. Yeah, that that's an yeah. American system and you know we're years out of that. But it's nice yeah, so not to have it's nice that our material doesn't have its home in in an administrative mm -hmm. faculty. Yeah. You want you want to keep control. <laughs> yeah. You want to keep control over our own. Yeah. It could never be a course could never be assembled from 
200 D2L sites. Well, anything in D2L is your intellectual property right now. I think that's what your contract tells you. Yeah, but even YouTube, you'd never be able to go through YouTube and sort of together. No. Of course, yeah. that yeah. would then replace the problem. Yeah. This well, is a kind of future concern. But well, it is a concern, and it is concerning the union. Yes. You know, yeah. 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 Y